We're continuing our study in uh, praying the Psalms, and so uh, you've uh, guessed, I guess, that we're in Psalm 73. And the title of this is uh, Honest Prayer. Honest Prayer. This is a psalm about doubt and discouragement. Have you ever heard this story? Satan was having a garage sale, and he had uh, all his tools out on a table there, and people were coming up, and uh, and then they said, uh, what about that over there on that table that's covered up? And he said, well, no, I can't sell that. That's worth more than all these tools that I'm trying to sell here. And the person said, well, uh, what is it? And uh, he said, that's my most valuable tool that I use. And he said, well, what is it? And he said, it's doubt and discouragement. And many people have, many of God's people have been discouraged and filled with doubt from Moses to uh, Elijah to the Apostle Paul to the writer of this psalm and probably you and me and this is a psalm about dealing with that and it's dealing with it in an honest way um, sometimes when we're when we're at our weakest we're at our strongest that's the whole theme of 2nd Corinthians and Paul learns then he says to depend upon God. And so what this psalmist does here, and what this is encouraging us to do, is not, not cover over these feelings, not to hide these, these thoughts that we have, but to bring them to God. And when that happens, we end up with a stronger faith. We have stronger faithfulness to God. There have been several people that have looked at the book of Psalms and they have, uh, I think it's very helpful, they looked at their different types of Psalms. There are Psalms when things are going well and the Psalmist praises God. Those are called Psalms of orientation. And then uh, and in Psalms there's a theme of going into a pit. And it's almost like, uh, as one writer said, uh, you're either coming out of the pit or you're about to go into the pit in, in life. But there are psalms when the psalmist is in the pit, and these are psalms of disorientation, when things seem to, it, it's all kind of trouble. And you live for God, what does it bring you? It just brings you more trouble. And the psalmist, they'll say that. And then there are psalms of reorientation, and that is after having been through troublesome times, difficult times, there's a new outlook. And sometimes, like in this psalm here, we have several of those in this one psalm. This psalmist starts off in disorientation, but at the end of the psalm, he has a reorientation. And it's not just a return back to where he was, it's a new outlook now that's completely changed everything. So in a sense, just as other passages of Scripture tell us, going through difficulties and trials it's not just grin and bear it. It's that it is to strengthen our, our faith. I mean, how will you know uh, if a battleship is able to sail out in the waters if it just stays in dry dock? That our faith is tested. And when it's tested and we pass the test, then we have a stronger faith and we have a reorientation, a different way of looking at things. In fact, even the thought process of the writer of this psalm shows the, the movement he makes from doubt to faith. And it goes in, through, and out of this disorientation into a new orientation or reorientation, which is marked by joyous trust. I mean, what do you do when your theology... And we might say, well, I don't have a theology. A theology just means what do you believe about God? What do you believe about what God says about himself? What do you believe about living for God? Uh, and all of us have a theology, whether it's a good theology or a bad theology, whether it's informed by Scripture or not. We have a theology. But what do you do when your theology clashes with reality, with really what's happening, and now you're in doubt? How do you hold to the conviction that God is good when life falls apart? Well, I belong to God. How, how is life falling apart now? In the book of Psalms, we have the raw emotions of these psalmists, of these writers, and they're real people. It's like they just hit the wall. 
and they express their doubts. And we see also in the book of Psalms deep reservoirs of truth that is found and can be used by us when we are in this world, when we're in periods of, of doubt. And what we see is that just when we think God is nowhere to be found, God is closer than we think. So Psalm 73. Uh, Brian read the last uh, few verses there, 25 through 28. I think it'd be a good exercise for us to pick up at verse 1 and read through verse 24. And the psalmist begins with his thesis statement. He begins with the truth that he's going to come out of the pit with. This is what, he's, this is what he, he learns. God is good. So verse 1. God certainly is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet came close to stumbling. My steps had almost slipped. For I was envious of the arrogant as I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no pains in their death, and their belly is fat. They are not in trouble like other people, nor are they tormented together with the rest of mankind. Therefore arrogance is their necklace. The garment of violence covers them. Their eyes bulges from fatness. The imaginations of their heart overflow. They mock and wickedly speak of oppression. They speak from on high. They have set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue parades through the earth. Therefore his people return here, and abundant waters are drunk by them. They say, How does God know? And is their knowledge with the Most High? Behold, these are the wicked, and always at ease. They have increased in wealth. Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure and wash my hands in innocence. For I have been stricken all day long and punished every morning. If I had said, I will speak this way, behold, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. When I thought of understanding this, it was troublesome in my sight until, until I entered the sanctuary of God. Then I perceived their end. You indeed put them on slippery ground. You drop them into ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment. They are utterly swept away by sudden terrors. Like a dream when one awakes, Lord, when stirred, you will despise their image. When my heart was embittered and I was pierced within, then I was stupid and ignorant. I was like an animal before you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You have taken hold of my right hand. You will guide me with your plan and afterward receive me to glory. And then you have the great verses that Brian read. That's where he is now. Who, whom do I have on earth that's like God in heaven? Now, if something's ever happened to you as a believer that you think is just so unfair and you don't understand why God didn't do something about it and how that God who is a good God could let that happen then we're called to sit here for a few minutes with this worship leader his name is given in the title who tells us his experience and his name is Asaph or Asaph and he was a leader he was one of the worship leaders under David and he's been watching He's been watching how the ungodly are getting along in the world. He might not have done this on purpose. I'm going to watch the ungodly and see what happens. But it maybe he was, uh, to put it in modern terms, maybe he was watching a show about celebrity homes. And he is thinking, how can they have so much money? How can they live this way? Maybe he uh, was doing business with an ungodly person. A person who just cursed God, but then this person's business is growing and they're just making all kind of, of money. We don't know how it started, but uh, we know that suddenly Asaf is, has started paying attention to the lives of the wicked. And not only just paying attention to the lives of the wicked, he's becoming envious of them. I don't understand it. Maybe I should just give up, give, give up all this. 
of following God and be one of the wicked. Because look, they don't have any problems. Now, he's certainly, you know, simplifying that because they do have problems. But as he sees it, this is a big problem to him from um, a, a way that this book is, is or put together uh, as some have noted, we have Psalm 73 is, is the theological center of the book. And the main theme of Psalm 73, what he's struggling with, is the prosperity of the wicked. Why do they prosper? And then the suffering of the righteous. I mean, look at verse 14. He says, For I have been stricken all day long and punished every morning. But then the wicked, they're living it up. They're making all kind of money. They don't have any problems. So that's his problem. Now what he's doing here, and I entitled this Honest Prayer, is he is honest with God. And this psalm is helping us to be honest with God. And it helps us transition from radical doubt to robust faith, to strong faith. Now, the way this is put together is really genius as, as all of Scripture. But uh, the way, the style and the way some of the things the psalmist uses, um, it, it makes a point. For instance, um, look at verse 1. God is certainly good to Israel. And then look at verse 28. But as for me, the nearness of God is good for me. So you have word, the, words, the word good like bookends in the very first verse and then the last verse. Um, and scholars call that an inclusio. It's like an, on both ends. And so in verse 1, that's his thesis. That's, what, that's how it came out. But that's not how, where he began. But you have that repetition of the word uh, good, uh, adjective good about God. And also, we're not going to read all these, but you have this statement. It's translated surely, and that means for certain. I, I know this. This is um, th this is something that's not in question. And so, in verse one, God is translated here: certainly good to Israel. Surely He's good to Israel. Verse thirteen, He says, surely, just as certain as, he's, as He is that God is is good to Israel, verse 13, when he's in the middle of that pit, in the middle of the doubt, he said, surely in vain I kept my heart pure. It's for nothing. In vain means useless, for nothing. That's how convinced he is. It's not just a fleeting thing that he's going through. He's at a point, just as at the end of this, he knows for certain God is good to Israel. In the middle of this, he feels for certain that he has lived a pure life for nothing. It's useless. And then look at verse 18. Here's another thing he knows for sure. For indeed, you put them on slippery ground. You surely put them on slippery ground. He knows as he's gone through it now, he has a different way of, of viewing this. Uh, another thing that of style that shows this, you have the repetition of the phrase, and I, or but I, and that's emphatic. But I'm like this. So verse 1, God is good to Israel. Then look at verse 2. But as for me, that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about my experience. I felt this way. And then look at the last verse. But as for me, the nearness of God is good for me. So he's telling us what he really he thinks. And oftentimes in the middle of this, it's in contrast but at the end of this, he says, okay, well, I'm standing here. I'm not, I don't care if everybody else in the world is not faithful to God. As for me, I'm faithful to God. Even though I look, I've looked at the world, but I've worked through all of that. Uh, there's also the occurrence many times of the word heart in this section. Six times it's found here. As uh, one writer put it, they said, ultimately resolving his struggle, his problem, depends on the disposition of his heart. And so, and when we think about heart, the English word heart is mainly the emotions, and we're thinking of it in a figurative way. You know, I love you with all my heart and all that. Um, and, and sometimes the Hebrew can be viewed that way, but mainly in Hebrew, the heart is the intellect, it's the will, it's the thinking. So in Hebrew, uh, you thought with the heart. 
And so you have the repetition of the word heart here. So again, it is a heart problem, but it's also a thinking problem. So he comes to a different way of thinking. Also throughout the psalm, you have, did you notice like many references of uh, body parts? So you have heart, so you have the feet, the eyes, the mouth of the wicked, the tongues of the wicked, and you have the inner parts, and that's emphasizing uh, the, ho the whole body. All right, here's a simple outline of Psalm 73 is, before we work through some of this a little more in depth. In verses 1 through 14 is his doubt. It's radical doubt. And that verse 1, as we said, that's the, that's the premise. That's his conclusion. Certainly, surely, God is good. He knows that. Verses 2 through 14 is the statement of the problem, which causes his doubt. And the problem is, I mean, he's, it's not, you know, something is minor. He says, my feet came close to stumbling. What does that mean? That means I'm about at the point where I'm turning my back on God. My steps almost slipped. How can a person get to that point? How can a, how can a believer get to that point? Well, he tells us in verse 3, I was envious of the arrogant, and I saw the prosperity of the wicked. That's what he saw. And then he characterizes them. And as I said, it's probably, this is in, in his mind. This, you know, he says, there are no pains in their death. Their belly is fat. They're prosperous. They're not in trouble. They're not tormented. They can wear arrogance like a necklace walking around. They mock. But it's like God doesn't do anything. So here am I trying to live faithfully. Throughout this section, you have they and then the psalmist. They are doing all this, he says. And they're affluent, they're rich, they're cynical, they're well off, but they seem to thrive. And it's almost like he has a fascination with this, but this fascination then is brought into tension. Look at verse 12. Behold, these are the wicked and always at ease. They have increased in wealth. And so surely, here's what I think, and I'm certain of this, I've kept my heart pure and washed my hands in innocent for nothing. It's in vain that I did this. And so in other words, my, the, my teaching that I've been taught told me the wicked would suffer. And you do have teaching like that. You have it in, you know, uh, like in Proverbs. You don't follow God, bad things will happen in this life. And that's a general truth. But there are exceptions to that. Job's an, another exception to this. But he, he's saying, the, I've been taught this. Now why do I see all this that, that, are, that they're prospering? And so the wicked begin to be an attractive way to live. Why don't I just live like them? It's useless to keep a clean heart. He's seduced by the world, by what he, he sees. And then, so that's verses 1 through 14, his doubt. And then verses 15 through 28 is the turning point, and that leads to renewed faith. The dawning begins. In verse 15, and it's it's and where he's coming to himself. Do you remember in the parable of the prodigal son and uh, the young son younger son goes to the father and uh, he says give me my inheritance now and that's equivalent to saying I wish you're dead give me what I'm supposed to get and in first century he's lucky that the son didn't get killed but the father who's pictured as a gracious father gives him his inheritance and he runs off to the far country and we don't know where that is but it's far from the father He's off in a far country, and he spends everything. You know, he lives it up for a while. Things are good, and he has a lot of friends until he runs out of money. Um, and then there is a turning point, and it says he came to himself. He's feeding pigs, a Jewish boy feeding pigs, and he comes to himself. 
And he says, I'll go back home. I'll go to my father's house. I can be a, I can be a servant. I can be a slave there. It's better off than here. But when he goes back to the house, the father is watching for him, and he sees him a long ways off, and he runs. Now, the father's pictured, he would be an older man, and he is to be dignified, I'm sure. But it doesn't matter about all that dignity because he sees the young son, and he runs, and he meets him. He falls on his neck, and he kisses him. And that's a picture of God's love for the prodigal, Jesus tells us. But there, notice there is that turning point. He came to himself. Well, the psalmist here in verse 15 is starting to come to himself. And what really bothers him is this. What will the children think? Is this how I want to be regarded? That I've just, you know, he was a worship leader. He was the leader of our people. And then all of a sudden he just, he's over there with the wicked now. And he said, I won't violate the trust that's been placed in me. He says, verse 15, I would have betrayed the generation of your children if I had done this. So it's troublesome in my sight. What am I going to do now about this? They're, they're very attractive, but I can't follow them. Now, that's pretty noble, I think. He's a gentleman. He's, uh, at least he's saying, and he realizes that sin, you see, sometimes as humans, we want to just sin and, it's, it's, and we have the idea, well, I'll just do it. I'm not hurting anybody but myself. And sin doesn't work that way. Sin can hurt generations. Sin can hurt those around us. And so he says, I'm not following the wicked. I'm not going. Perhaps maybe that was with some regret. I wish I could, but I'm not going to do that. He still has some work to do, some decisions to make, but this unease is, is letting up some. And there is a specific turning point. Look at verse 17. Until I entered the sanctuary of God. That's the turning point. How'd that happen? I mean, one day you just decide. And we'd like to know when we're not told but he's attracted to the wicked until, until. That's a decisive time. That's a change in perspective. Until. There's a new re, uh, orientation now. A refocusing. He sees things differently. And then what does he see? He says in verse 17, Then I perceived they are in. And the they are there, the they that he said, they're living in sin, they're living it up, and they're prospering. And now the psalm moves in a different direction. Up to this point, it's been the I and they. I see this, I live my, I live a pure life, but it doesn't get me anywhere. And they are living it up. But now things have changed. Outside the sanctuary, he was deceived. Only in the presence of God in the community of faith did this light come upon him, this new setting. It's almost like he figuratively takes a deep breath and he shouts, here's what I learned. Until I came to the sanctuary, I didn't know this. Here's what I learned. And the key is their end. And so that's the turning point. When I entered God's sanctuary, And yet we might ask, didn't you already know this? Why are you all excited about this, this now? Well, one thing we can be certain is this insight that he gets, this fresh insight, has something to do with the place. It has to do with the sanctuary as a sacred spot. I guess the temple in, in his day. But the decisive thing is the relationship that he found there. And so, in the remainder of the psalm, he said, the prospering wicked, that's like a dream. It's just unreal. It's like figments in the imagination. You know, it, it, you ever have a dream? I, I, don't, I don't think I have many dreams. If I do, I don't remember when I wake up. But um, some people do. And, but a dream can seem very, very real. And, but he said, there, it's just a dream. And... I'm not going to follow that because I'm sure now 
that God is good to his people. Now, look at uh, verse 21. When my heart was embittered, I was pierced within. And I was really like a stupid and ignorant animal before you, he says. But I, until I came to the sanctuary, now there's a change. Now, verse 23, I'm continually with you. You've taken hold of my right hand. You'll guide me with your plan and afterward receive me to glory. What's afterward? After death? Could be. What does it mean receive to glory? So he has some sort of a hint of something that happens after this life. And he is lifting his eyes heavenward. Now, there are a few things, practical things that I want to point out and then we're going to have a prayer and then we'll close. But we talked about a disorientation that's when you, things you know are just cloudy you don't you can't understand anything that's where he is up to verse 17 but then after verse 17 there is a reorientation a different way of seeing things and there's a different way or a reorientation toward the wicked verses 18 through 20 as we said he sees now they're on slippery ground they're not really it may seem they're prospering but they're not. There is a reorientation concerning himself. Verses 21 and 22. I was bitter. I was like an animal. But I now know I'm continually with you. And there's a reorientation concerning God's presence. Verses 23 through the end of the book. What's interesting is is uh, look at the last verse, verse 28. I have made the Lord God my refuge. You go through the whole psalm, you don't have the name Lord until you get to the last verse. You have God, but you only have Lord in the last verse. Lord is Yahweh, it's God's personal name. And so it's almost like, I guess I thought I had a, a good relationship but then I'm attracted by the wicked but now I have a reorientation and I see that the Lord God that he is personally with me and so he's arrived at this new viewpoint this reorientation this new orientation it's like uh, one person put it light breaks through in this psalm so that it began with a problem now it ends with the full sunlight of resolution what this psalm teaches us is we're to be honest with God pour out our hearts to God and it may be this same problem or maybe another problem but um, God wants us to be honest uh, to weigh our choices carefully to determine how it could affect a lot of people um, to try to get the big picture he gets the big picture the big picture is I know you're always with me and the wicked they're just on slippery ground they can go down at any moment and to have this reorientation. Now, like we've been doing in the past uh, studies, I want us to, uh, to pray together in just a moment. Here's some things, some guides, a prayer guide from this. One is pray that we will be boldly honest with God. A second thing from this psalm, pray that we see, the, as he learned, the pleasures of sin are fleeting. This is like a, a dream. Pray that we will see and that we will not envy the wicked. Because, I mean, we might say, oh, I'd never do that. He did. He's a worship leader. And then finally, to pray that we see God as our strength and portion forever. So, with those four things, pray that we will be boldly honest with God. Pray that we see the pleasures of sin as fleeting for just a, a season, as Scripture tells us. That we don't envy the wicked and that we see God as our strength and portion forever. So will you bow with me as we go to God in prayer? Dear Father, we bow before you with humility and we thank you very much for this wonderful book of Psalms. And we thank you, Father, for what is recorded here for us. And uh, we are thankful that uh, the, the thoughts and heart of this of, uh, uh, your servant, Asaf, has been recorded for us. And 
It's repeated many, many times, perhaps in our own lives. And we thank, we're thankful, Father, for the uh, instruction that's here to help us. And we pray, Father, that we will be boldly honest with you. And we pray also, Father, that we will see sin for what it is, even though it's presented and is pleasurable, that we will see that as fleeting and um, separating us from you. We pray, Father, that you will help us not to envy the wicked, the powerful, the wealthy, to keep our eyes on you. And we pray, Father, that you will help us every day that we live to see more and more that you are our strength of our hearts and our portion forever. And we're very thankful that you sent Christ to be our Savior and help us to keep our eyes on Christ as we walk through this world and help us uh, to be faithful to you and help us in periods of doubt and discouragement to become stronger as we go through them. Thank you for your love, for your care for us. In these things we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Number 717 is the invitation song, Victory in Jesus. We're going to sing that. If you're not a Christian, we call you to turn away from the allure of the world and to put your trust and your faith in Christ as Savior. As you repent, confess the name of Jesus, you're immersed. If you've done that and you've wandered away, and perhaps you're in the middle of this as this psalmist is, we call you to keep your eyes on Jesus, put your eyes on Jesus, and to have a reorientation, to have a different outlook, a different view. And it's amazing what that can do for a life. There may be a turning point in your life, and the turning point in your life might be right now. And so we call you to set your eyes once again on God as your portion, as your strength in Jesus. And uh, we're here to help you in any way that we can while we stand and while we sing.